The Good Earth Chapter 1 It was Wang Lung's marriage day. At first, opening his eyes in the blackness of the curtains about his bed, he could not think why the dawn seemed different from any other. The house was still except for the faint, gasping cough of his old father, whose room was opposite to his own across the middle room. Every morning the old man's cough was the first sound to be heard. Wang Lung usually lay listening to it and moved only when he heard it approaching nearer and when he heard the door of his father's room squeak upon its wooden hinges. But this morning he did not wait. He sprang up and pushed aside the curtains of his bed. It was a dark, ruddy dawn, and through a small square hole of a window, where the tattered paper fluttered, a glimpse of bronze sky gleamed. He went to the hole and tore the paper away. It is spring and I do not need this, he muttered. He was ashamed to say aloud that he wished the house to look neat on this day. The hole was barely large enough to admit his hand and he thrust it out to feel of the air. A small soft wind blew gently from the east, a wind mild and murmurous and full of rain. It was a good omen. The fields needed rain for fruition. There would be no rain this day, but within a few days, if this wind continued, there would be water. It was good. Yesterday he had said to his father that if this brazen, glittering sunshine continued, the wheat could not fill in the ear. Now it was as if heaven had chosen this day to wish him well. Earth would bear fruit. He hurried out into the middle room, drawing on his blue outer trousers as he went, and nodding about the fullness at his waist his girdle of blue cotton cloth. He left his upper body bare until he had heated water to bathe himself. He went into the shed which was the kitchen, leaning against the house, and out of its dusk an ox twisted its head from behind the corner next the door and loaded him deeply. The kitchen was made of earth and bricks as the house was, great squares of earth dug from their own fields, and thatched with straw from their own wheat. Out of their own earth had his grandfather in his youth fashioned also the oven, baked in black with many years of meal preparing. On top of this earthen structure stood a deep, round, iron cauldron. This cauldron he filled partly full of water, dipping it with a half-gourd from an earthen jar that stood near, but he dipped cautiously, for water was precious. Then, after a hesitation, he suddenly lifted the jar and emptied all the water into the cauldron. This day he would bathe his whole body. Not since he was a child knee had anyone looked upon his body. Today one would, and he would have it clean. He went around the oven to the rear and selecting a handful of the dry grass and stalks standing in the corner of the kitchen, he arranged it delicately in the mouth of the oven, making the most of every leaf. Then from an old flint and iron he caught a flame and thrust it into the straw, and there was a blaze. This was the last morning he would have to light the fire. He had lit it every morning since his mother died six years before. He had lit the fire, boiled water, and poured the water into a bowl and taken it into the room where his father sat upon his bed, coughing and fumbling for his shoes upon the floor. Every morning for these six years the old man had waited for his son to bring in hot water to ease him of his morning coughing. Now father and son could rest. There was a woman coming to the house. Never again would Wang Lung have to rise summer and winter at dawn to light the fire. He could lie in his bed and wait, and he also would have a bowl of water brought to him, and if the earth were fruitful there would be tea leaves in the water. Once in some years it was so. And if the woman wearied, there would be her children to light the fire, the many children she would bear to Wang Lung. Wang Lung stopped, struck by the thought of children running in and out of their three rooms. Three rooms had always seemed much to them, a house half empty since his mother died. They were always having to resist relatives who were more crowded his uncle, with his endless brood of children, coaxing. Now, how can two lone men need so much room? Cannot father and son sleep together? The warmth of the young one's body will comfort the old one's cough. But the father always replied, I am saving my bed for my grandson. He will warm my bones in my age. Now the grandsons were coming, grandsons upon grandsons. They would have to put beds along the walls and in the middle room. The house would be full of beds. The blaze in the oven died down while Wang Lung thought of all the beds there would be in the half-empty house, and the water began to chill in the cauldron. 
The shadowy figure of the old man appeared in the doorway, holding his unbuttoned garments about him. He was coughing and spitting and he gasped. How is it that there is not water yet to heat my lungs? Wang Lung stared and recalled himself and was ashamed. This fuel is damp, he muttered from behind the stove. The damp wind dash. The old man continued to cough perseveringly and would not cease until the water boiled. Wang Lung dipped some into a bowl, and then, after a moment, he opened a glazed jar that stood upon a ledge of the stove and took from it a dozen or so of the curled dried leaves and sprinkled them upon the surface of the water. The old man's eyes opened greedily and immediately he began to complain. Why are you wasteful? Tea is like eating silver. It is the day, replied Wang Lung with a short laugh. Eat and be comforted. The old man grasped the bowl in his shriveled, knotty fingers, muttering, uttering little grunts. He watched the leaves uncurl and spread upon the surface of the water, unable to bear drinking the precious stuff. It will be cold, said Wang Lung. True true dash said the old man in alarm, and he began to take great gulps of the hot tea. He passed into an animal satisfaction, like a child fixed upon its feeding. But he was not too forgetful to see Wang Lung dipping the water recklessly from the cauldron into a deep wooden tub. He lifted his head and stared at his son. Now there is water enough to bring a crop to fruit, he said suddenly. Wang Lung continued to dip the water to the last drop. He did not answer. Now then, cried his father loudly. I have not washed my body all at once since the new year, said Wang Lung in a low voice. He was ashamed to say to his father that he wished his body to be clean for a woman to see. He hurried out, carrying the tub to his own room. The door was hung loosely upon a warped wooden frame and it did not shut closely, and the old man tottered into the middle room and put his mouth to the opening and bawled. It will be ill if we start the woman like this tea in the morning water and all this washing. It is only one day, shouted Wang Lung. And then he added, I will throw the water on the earth when I am finished and it is not all waste. The old man was silent at this, and Wang Lung unfastened his girdle and stepped out of his clothing. In the light that streamed in a square block from the hole he wrung a small towel from the steaming water and he scrubbed his dark slender body vigorously. Warm though he had thought the air, when his flesh was wet, he was cold, and he moved quickly, passing the towel in and out of the water until from his whole body there went up a delicate cloud of steam. Then he went to a box that had been his mother's and drew from it a fresh suit of blue cotton cloth. He might be a little cold this day without the wadding of the winter garments, but he suddenly could not bear to put them on against his clean flesh. The covering of them was torn and filthy and the wadding stuck out of the holes, gray and sodden. He did not want sticking out of his clothes. Later she would have to wash and mend, but not the first day. He drew over the blue cotton coat and trousers a long robe made of the same material as one long robe, which he wore on feast days only, ten days or so in the year, all told. Then with swift fingers he unplated the long braid of hair that hung down his back, and taking a wooden comb from the drawer of the small, unsteady table, he began to comb out his hair. His father drew near again and put his mouth to the crack of the door. Am I to have nothing to eat this day? he complained. At my age the bones are water in the morning until food is given them. I am coming, said Wang Lung, braiding his hair quickly and smoothly and weaving into the strands a tasseled, black silk cord. Then after a moment he removed his long gown and wound his braid about his head and went out, carrying the tub of water. He had quite forgotten the breakfast. He would stir a little water into cornmeal and give it to his father. For himself he could not eat. He staggered with the tub to the threshold and poured the water upon the earth nearest the door, and as he did so he remembered he had used all the water in the cauldron for his bathing and he would have to start the fire again. A wave of anger passed over him at his father. That old head thinks of nothing except his eating and his drinking, he muttered into the mouth of the oven, but aloud he said nothing. It was the last morning he would have to prepare food for the old man. He put a very little water into the cauldron, drawing it in a bucket from the well near the door, and it boiled quickly and he stirred meal together and took it to the old man. We will have rice this night, my father, he said. Meanwhile, here is corn. 
There is only a little rice left in the basket, said the old man, seating himself at the table in the middle room and stirring with his chopsticks the thick yellow gruel. We will eat a little less then at the spring festival, said Wang Lung. But the old man did not hear. He was supping loudly at his bowl. Wang Lung went into his own room then, and drew about him again the long blue robe and let down the braid of his hair. He passed his hand over his shaven brow and over his cheeks. Perhaps he had better be newly shaven? It was scarcely sunrise yet. He could pass through the street of the barbers and be shaved before he went to the house where the woman waited for him. If he had the money, he would do it. He took from his small greasy pouch of gray cloth and counted the money in it. There were six silver dollars and a double handful of copper coins. He had not yet told his father he had asked friends to sup that night. He had asked his male cousin, the young son of his uncle, and his uncle for his father's sake, and three neighboring farmers who lived in the village with him. He had planned to bring back from the town that morning pork, a small pond fish, and a handful of chestnuts. He might even buy a few of the bamboo sprouts from the south and a little beef to stew with the cabbage he had raised in his own garden. But this only if there were any money left after the bean oil and the soybean sauce had been bought. If he shaved his head he could not, perhaps, buy the beef. Well, he would shave his head, he decided suddenly. He left the old man without speech and went out into the early morning. In spite of the dark red dawn the sun was mounting the horizon clouds and sparkled upon the dew on the rising wheat and barley. The farmer in Wang Lung was diverted for an instant and he stooped to examine the budding heads. They were empty as yet and waiting for the rain. He smelled the air and looked anxiously at the sky. Rain was there, dark in the clouds, heavy upon the wind. He would buy a stick of incense and place it in the little temple to the earth god. On a day like this he would do it. He wound his way in among the fields upon the narrow path. In the near distance the grey city wall arose. Within that gate in the wall through which he would pass stood the great house where the woman had been a slave girl since her childhood, the house of Wong. There were those who said, It is better to live alone than to marry a woman who has been a slave in a great house. But when he had said to his father, Am I never to have a woman? His father replied, With weddings costing as they do in these evil days, and every woman wanting gold rings and silk clothes, before she will take a man, there remain only slaves to be had for the poor. His father had stirred himself, then, and gone to the house of Huan and asked if there were a slave to spare. Not a slave too young, and above all, not a pretty one, he had said. Wang Lung had suffered that she must not be pretty. It would be something to have a pretty wife that other men would congratulate him upon having. His father, seeing his mutinous face, had cried out at him. And what will we do with a pretty woman? We must have a woman who will tend the house and bear children. Will a pretty woman do as she works in the fields, these things? She will be forever thinking about clothes to go with her face. No, not a pretty woman in our house. We are farmers. Moreover, who has heard of a pretty slave who was virgin in a wealthy house? All the young lords have had their fill of her. It is better to be first with an ugly woman than the hundredth with a beauty. Do you imagine a pretty woman will think your farmer's hands as pleasing as the soft hands of a rich man's son, and your son black face as beautiful as the golden skin of the others who have had her for their pleasure? Wang Lung knew his father spoke well. Nevertheless, he had to struggle with his flesh before he could answer. And then he said violently, At least, I will not have a woman who is pockmarked, or who has a split upper lip. We will have to see what is to be had, his father replied. Well, the woman was not pockmarked, nor had she a split upper lip. This much he knew, but nothing more. He and his father had bought two silver rings, washed with gold, and silver earrings, and these his father had taken to the woman's owner in acknowledgment of betrothal. Beyond this, he knew nothing of the woman who was to be his, except that on this day he could go and get her. He walked into the cool darkness of the city gate. Water carriers, just outside, their barrows laden, with great tubs of water, passed to and fro all day, the water splashing out of the tubs upon the stones. It was always wet and cool in the tunnel of the gate under the thick wall of earth and brick, 
cool even upon a summer's day, so that the melon vendors spread their fruits upon the stones, melons split open to drink in the moist coolness. There were none yet, for the season was too early, but baskets of small hard green peaches stood along the walls, and the vendor cried out. The first peaches of spring the first peaches. Buy, eat, purge your bowels of the poisons of winter. Wang Lung said to himself. If she likes them, I will buy her a handful when we return. He could not realize that when he walked back through the gate there would be a woman walking behind him. He turned to the right within the gate and after a moment was in the street of the barbers. There were few before him so early, only some farmers who had carried their produce into the town the night before in order that they might sell their vegetables at the dawn markets and return for the day's work in the fields. They had slept shivering and crouching over their baskets, the baskets now empty at their feet. Wang Lung avoided them lest some recognize him, for he wanted none of their joking on this day. All down the street in a long line the barbers stood behind their small stalls, and Wang Lung went to the furthest one and sat down upon the stool and motioned to the barber who stood chattering to his neighbor. The barber came at once and began quickly to pour hot water, from a kettle on his pot of charcoal, into his brass basin. Shave everything, he said in a professional tone. My head and my face, replied Wang Lung. Ears and nostrils cleaned, asked the barber. How much will that cost extra, asked Wang Lung cautiously. Four pence, said the barber, beginning to pass a black cloth in and out of the hot water. I will give you two, said Wang Lung. Then I will clean one ear and one nostril, rejoined Ted the barber promptly. On which side of the face do you wish it done? He grimaced at the next barber as he spoke and the other burst into a guffaw. Wang Lung perceived that he had fallen into the hands of a joker, and feeling inferior in some unaccountable way, as he always did, to these town dwellers, even though they were only barbers and the lowest of persons, he said quickly, As you will as you will dash. Then he submitted himself to the barber's soaping and rubbing and shaving, and being after all a generous fellow enough, the barber gave him without extra charge a series of skillful poundings upon his shoulders and back to loosen his muscles. He commented upon Wang Lung as he shaved his upper forehead. This would not be a bad-looking farmer if he would cut off his hair. The new fashion is to take off the braid. His razor hovered so near the circle of hair upon Wang Lung's crown that Wang Lung cried out. I cannot cut it off without asking my father. And the barber laughed and skirted the round spot of hair. When it was finished and the money counted into the barber's wrinkled, water-soaked hand, Wang Lung had a moment of horror. So much money! But walking down the street again with the wind fresh upon his shaven skin, he said to himself, It is only once. He went to the market, then, and bought two pounds of pork and watched the butcher as he wrapped it in a dried lotus leaf, and then, hesitating, he bought also six ounces of beef. When all had been bought, even to fresh squares of bean curd, shivering in a jelly upon its leaf, he went to a candlemaker's shop and there he bought a pair of incense sticks. Then he turned his steps with great shyness toward the house of Huang. Once at the gate of the house he was seized with terror. How had he come alone? He should have asked his father, his uncle, even his nearest neighbor, Ching anyone to come with him. He had never been in a great house before. How could he go in with his wedding feast on his arm and say, I have come for a woman? He stood at the gate for a long time, looking at it. It was closed fast, two great wooden gates, painted black and bound and studded with iron, closed upon each other. Two lions made of stone stood on guard, one at either side. There was no one else. He turned away. It was impossible. He felt suddenly faint. He would go first and buy a little food. He had eaten nothing had forgotten food. He went into a small street restaurant and putting. Two pence upon the table, he sat down. A dirty waiting boy with a shiny black apron came near and he called out to him, two bowls of noodles. And when they came, he ate them down greedily, pushing them into his mouth with his bamboo chopsticks, while the boy stood and spun the coppers between his black thumb and forefinger. Will you have more? asked the boy indifferently. 
Wang Lung shook his head. He sat up and looked about. There was no one he knew in the small, dark, crowded room full of tables. Only a few men sat eating or drinking tea. It was a place for poor men, and among them he looked neat and clean and almost well-to-do, so that a beggar, passing, whined at him. Have a good heart, teacher, and give me a small cash I starve. Wang Lung had never had a beggar ask of him before, nor had any ever called him teacher. He was pleased and he threw into the beggar's bowl two small cash, which are one-fifth of a penny, and the beggar pulled back with swiftness his black claw of a hand, and grasping the cash, fumbled them within his rags. Wang Lung sat and the sun climbed upwards. The waiting boy lounged about impatiently. If you are buying nothing more, he said at last with much impudence, you will have to pay rent for the stool. Wang Lung was incensed at such impudence, and he risen except that when he thought of going into the great house of Huang and of asking there for a woman, sweat broke out over his whole body as though he were working in a field. Bring me tea, he said weakly to the boy. Before he could turn it was there and the small boy demanded sharply. Where is the penny? And Wang Lung, to his horror, found there was nothing to do but to produce from his girdle yet another penny. It is robbery, he muttered, unwilling. Then he saw entering the shop his neighbor whom he had invited to the feast, and he put the penny hastily upon the table and drank the tea at a gulp and went out quickly by the side door and was once more upon the street. It is to be done, he said to himself desperately, and slowly he turned his way to the great gates. This time, since it was after high noon, the gates were the threshold, ajar and the keeper of the gate idled upon picking his teeth with a bamboo sliver after his meal. He was a tall fellow with a large mole upon his left cheek, and from the mole hung three long black hairs which had never been cut. When Wang Lung appeared he shouted roughly, thinking from the basket that he had come to sell something. Now then, what? With great difficulty Wang Lung replied, I am Wang Lung, the farmer. Well, and Wang Lung, the farmer, what? retorted the gateman, who was polite to none except the rich friends of his master and mistress. I am come, I am come, dash, faltered Wang Lung. That I see, said the gateman with elaborate patience, twisting the long hairs of his mole. There is a woman, said Wang Lung, his voice sinking helplessly to a whisper. In the sunshine his face was wet. The gateman gave a great laugh. So you are he, he roared. I was told to expect a bridegroom today. But I did not recognize you with a basket on your arm. It is only a few meats, said Wang Lung apologetically, waiting for the gateman to lead him within. But the gateman did not move. At last Wang Lung said with anxiety, Shall I go alone? The gateman affected a start of horror. The old lord would kill you. Then seeing that Wang Lung was too innocent he said, A little silver is a good key. Wang Lung saw at last that the man wanted money of him. I am a poor man, he said pleadingly. Let me see what you have in your girdle, said the gateman. And he grinned when Wang Lung in his simplicity actually put his basket upon the stones and lifting his robe took out the small bag from his girdle and shook into his left hand what money was left after his purchases. There was one silver piece and fourteen copper pence. I will take the silver, said the gateman coolly, and before Wang Lung could protest the man had the silver in his sleeve and was striding through the gate, bawling loudly. The bridegroom, the bridegroom. Wang Lung, in spite of anger at what had just happened in horror at this loud announcing of his coming, could do nothing but follow, and this he did, picking up his basket and looking neither to the right nor left. Afterwards, although it was the first time he had ever been in a great family's house, he could remember nothing. With his face burning and his head bowed, he walked through court after court, hearing that voice roaring ahead of him, hearing tinkles of laughter on every side. Then suddenly when it seemed to him, he had gone through a hundred courts, the gateman fell silent and pushed him into a small waiting room. There he stood alone while the gateman went into some inner place, returning in a moment to say, The old mistress says you are to appear before her. Wang Lung started forward. But the gateman stopped him, crying in disgust. You cannot appear before a great lady with a basket on your arm a basket of pork and bean curd. How will you bow? True, true, said Wang Lung in agitation. 
but he did not dare to put the basket down because he was afraid something might be stolen from it. It did not occur to him that all the world might not desire such delicacies as two pounds of pork and six ounces of beef and a small pond fish. The gateman saw his fear and cried out in great contempt. In a house like this we feed these meats to the dogs, and seizing the basket he thrust it behind the door and pushed Wang Lung ahead of him. Down a long narrow veranda they went, the roofs supported by delicate carven posts, and into a hall the like of which Wang Lung had never seen. A score of houses such as his whole house could have been put into it and have disappeared, so wide were the spaces, so high the roofs. Lifting his head in wonder to see the unpainted beams above him he stumbled upon the yet carven high threshold of the door and would have fallen except that the gateman caught his arm and cried out. Now will you be so polite as to fall on your face like this before the old mistress? And collecting himself in great shame Wang Lung looked ahead of him, and upon a dais in the center of the room he saw a very old lady, her small fine body clothed in lustrous, pearly gray satin, and upon the low bench beside her a pipe of opium superscript three stood burning over its little lamp. She looked at him out of small, sharp, black eyes, as sunken and sharp as a monkey's eyes in her thin and wrinkled face. The skin of her hand that held the pipe's end was stretched over her little bones as smooth and as yellow as the gilt upon an idol. Wang Lung fell to his knees and knocked his head on the tiled floor. Raise him, said the old lady gravely to the gateman, these obeisances are not necessary. Has he come for the woman? Yes, ancient one, replied the gateman. Why does he not speak for himself? Asked the old lady. Because he is a fool, ancient one, said the gateman, twirling the hairs of his mole. This roused Wang Lung and he looked with indignation at the gateman. I am only a coarse person, great and ancient lady, he said. I do not know what words to use in such a presence. The old lady looked at him carefully and with perfect gravity and made as though she would have spoken, except that her hand closed upon the pipe which a slave had been tending for her and at once she seemed to forget him. She bent and sucked greedily at the pipe for a moment and the sharpness passed from her eyes and a film of forgetfulness came over them. Wang Lung remained standing before her until in passing her eyes caught his figure. What is this man doing here? she asked with sudden anger. It was as though she had forgotten everything. The gateman's face was immovable. He said nothing. I am waiting for the woman, great lady, said Wang Lung in much astonishment. The woman? What woman? The old lady began, but the slave girl at her side stooped and whispered, and the lady recovered herself. Ah, yes, I forgot for the moment a small affair you have come for the slave called Olan. I remember we promised her to some farmer in marriage. You are that farmer? I am he, replied Wang Lung. Call Olan quickly, said the old lady to her slave. It was as though she was suddenly impatient to be done with all this and to be left alone in the stillness of the great room with her opium pipe. And in an instant the slave appeared leading by the hand a square, rather tall figure, clothed in clean blue cotton coat and trousers. Wang Lung glanced once and then away, his heart beating. This was his woman. Come here, slave, said the old lady carelessly. This man has come for you. The woman went before the lady and stood with bowed head and hands clasped. Are you ready? asked the lady. The woman answered slowly as an echo, ready. Wang Lung, hearing her voice for the first time, looked at her back as she stood before him. It was a good enough voice, not loud, not soft, plain, and not ill-tempered. The woman's hair was neat and smooth and her coat clean. He saw with an instant's disappointment that her feet were not bound. But this he could not dwell upon, for the old lady was saying to the gateman, carry her box out to the gate and let them be gone. And then she called Wang Lung and said, stand beside her while I speak. And when Wang had come forward, she said to him, this woman came into our house when she was a child of ten and here, she has lived until now, when she is twenty years old. I bought her in a year of famine when her parents came south because they had nothing to eat. They were from the north in Shantun and there they returned, and I know nothing further of them. You see she has the strong body and the square cheeks of her kind. She will work well for you in the field and drawing water and all else that you wish. She is not beautiful but that you do not need. 
Only men of leisure have the need for beautiful women to divert them. Neither is she clever. But she does well what she is told to do and she has a good temper. So far as I know she is virgin. She has not beauty enough to tempt my sons and grandsons even if she had not been in the kitchen. If there has been anything it has been only a serving man. But with the innumerable and pretty slaves running freely about the courts, I doubt if there has been anyone. Take her and use her well. She is a good slave, although somewhat slow and stupid, and had I not wished to acquire merit at the temple for my future existence by bringing more life into the world I should have kept her, for she is good enough for the kitchen. But I marry my slaves off if any will have them and the lords do not want them. And to the woman she said, Obey him and bear him sons and yet more sons. Bring the first child to me to see. Yes, ancient mistress, said the woman submissively. They stood hesitating, and Wang Lung was greatly embarrassed, not knowing whether he should speak or what. Well, go, will you, said the old lady in irritation, and Wang Lung, bowing hastily, turned and went out, the woman after him, and after her the gateman, carrying on his shoulder the box. This box he dropped down in the room where Wang Lung returned to find his basket and would carry it no further, and indeed he disappeared without another word. Then Wang Lung turned to the woman and looked at her for the first time. She had a square, honest face, a short, broad nose with large black nostrils, and her mouth was white as a gash in her face. Her eyes were small and of a dull black in color, and were filled with some sadness that was not clearly expressed. It was a face that seemed habitually silent and unspeaking, as though it could not speak if it would. She bore patiently Wang Lung's look, without embarrassment or response, simply waiting until he had seen her. He saw that it was true there was not beauty of any kind in her face a brown, common, patient face. But there were no pockmarks on her dark skin, nor was her lip split. In her ears he saw his rings hanging, the gold-washed rings he had bought, and on her hands were the rings he had given her. He turned away with secret exultation. Well, he had his woman. Here is this box and this basket, he said gruffly. Without a word she bent over and picking up one end of the box she placed it upon her shoulder and, staggering under its weight, tried to rise. He watched her at this and suddenly he said, I will take the box. Here is the basket. And he shifted the box to his own back, regardless of the best robe he wore, and she, still speechless, took the handle of the basket. He thought of the hundred courts he had come through and of his figure, absurd under its burden. If there were a side gate he muttered, and she nodded after a little thought, as though she did not understand too quickly what he said. Then she led the way through a small and used court that was grown up withered, its pool choked, and there under a bent pine tree was an old round gate that she pulled loose from its bar, and they went through and into the street. Once or twice he looked back at her. She plodded along steadily on her big feet as though she had walked there all her life, her wide face expressionless. In the gate of the wall he stopped uncertainly and fumbled in his girdle with one hand for the pennies he had left, holding the box steady on his shoulder with the other hand. He took out two pence and with these he bought six small green peaches. Take these and eat them for yourself, he said gruffly. She clutched them greedily as a child might and held them in her hand without speech. When next he looked at her as they walked along the margin of the wheat fields she was nibbling one cautiously but when she saw him looking at her she covered it again with her hand and kept her jaws motionless. And thus they went until they reached the western field where stood the temple to the earth. This temple was a small structure, not higher in all than a man's shoulder and made of grey bricks and roofed with tile. Wang Lung's grandfather, who had farmed the very fields upon which Wang Lung now spent his life, had built it, hauling the bricks from the town upon his wheelbarrow. The walls were covered with plaster on the outside and a village artist had been hired in a good year once to paint upon the white plaster a scene of hills and bamboo. But the rain of generations had poured upon this painting until now there was only a faint feathery shadow of bamboos left, and the hills were almost wholly gone. Within the temple snugly under the roof sat two small, solemn figures, earthen, for they were formed from the earth of the fields about the temple. These were the god himself and his lady. They wore robes of red and gilt paper, and the god had a scant, drooping mustache of real hair. 
Each year at the New Year Wang Lung's father bought sheets of red paper and carefully cut and pasted new robes for the pair. And each year rain and snow beat in and the sun of summer shone in and spoiled their robes. At this moment, however, the robes were still new, since the year was but well begun, and Wang Lung was proud of their spruce appearance. He took the basket from the woman's arm and carefully he looked about under the pork for the sticks of incense he had bought. He was anxious lest they were broken and thus make an evil omen, but they were whole, and when he had found them he stuck them side by side in the ashes of other sticks of incense that were heaped before the gods, for the whole neighborhood worshipped these two small figures. Then fumbling for his flint and iron he caught, with a dried leaf for tinder, a flame to light the incense. Together this man and this woman stood before the gods of their fields. The woman watched the ends of the incense redden and turn gray. When the ash grew heavy she leaned over and with her forefinger she pushed the head of ash away. Then as though fearful for what she had done, she looked quickly at Wang Lung, her eyes dumb. But there was something he liked in her movement. It was as though she felt that the incense belonged to them both, it was a moment of marriage. They stood there in complete silence, side by side, while the incense smoldered into ashes, and then because the sun was sinking, Wang Lung shouldered the box and they went home. At the door of the house the old man stood to catch the last rays of the sun upon him. He made no movement as Wang Lung approached with the woman. It would have been beneath him to notice her. Instead, he feigned great interest in the clouds and he cried, That cloud which hangs upon the left horn of the new moon speaks of rain. It will come not later than tomorrow night. And then, as he saw Wang Lung take the basket from the woman, he cried again, And have you spent money? Wang Lung set the basket on the table. There will be guests tonight, he said briefly, and he carried the box into the room where he slept and set it down beside the box where his own clothes were. He looked at it strangely. But the old man came to the door and said volubly, There is no end to the money spent in this house. Secretly he was pleased that his son had invited guests, but he felt it would not do to give out anything but complaints before his new daughter-in-law lest she be set from the first in ways of extravagance. Wang Lung said nothing, but he went out and took the basket into the kitchen and the woman followed him there. He took the food piece by piece from the basket and laid it upon the ledge of the cold stove and he said to her, Here is pork and here beef and fish. There are seven to eat. Can you prepare food? He did not look at the woman as he spoke. It would not have been seemly. The woman answered in her plain voice, I have been kitchen slave since I went into the house of Huang. There were meats at every meal. Wang Lung nodded and left her and did not see her again until the guests came crowding in, his uncle jovial and sly and hungry, his uncle's son an impudent lad of fifteen, and the farmers clumsy and grinning with shyness. Two were men from the village with whom Wang Lung exchanged seed and labor at harvest time, and one was his next-door neighbor, Ching, a small, quiet man, ever unwilling to speak unless he were compelled to it. After they had been seated about the middle room with demurring and unwillingness to take seats, for politeness, Wang Lung went into the kitchen to bid the woman serve. Then he was pleased when she said to him, I will hand you the bowls if you will place them upon the table. I do not like to come out before men. Wang Lung felt in him a great pride that this woman was his and did not fear to appear before him, but would not before other men. He took the bowls from her hands at the kitchen door and he set them upon the table in the middle room and called loudly, Eat! my uncle and my brothers. And when the uncle, who was fond of jokes, said, Are we not to see the moth-browed bride? Wang Lung replied firmly, We are not yet one. It is not meet that other men see her until the marriage is consummated. And he urged them to eat and they ate heartily of the good fare, heartily and in silence, and this one praised the brown sauce on the fish and that one the well-done pork, and Wang Lung said over and over in reply, it is poor stuff it is badly prepared. But in his heart he was proud of the dishes, for with what meat she had the woman had combined sugar and vinegar and a little wine and soy sauce and she had skillfully brought forth all the force of the meat itself, so that Wang Lung himself had never tasted such dishes upon the tables of his friends. That night after the guests had tarried long over their tea and had done with their jokes, 
the woman still lingered behind the stove, and when Wang Lung had seen in the last guest away he went in and she cowered there the straw piles asleep beside the ox. There was straw in her hair when he roused her, and when he called her she put up her arm suddenly in her sleep as though to defend herself from a blow. When she opened her eyes at last, she looked at him with her strange speechless gaze, and he felt as though he faced a child. He took her by the hand and led her into the room where that morning he had bathed himself for her, and he lit a red candle upon the table. In this light he was suddenly shy when he found himself alone with the woman and he was compelled to remind himself. There is this woman of mine. The thing is to be done. And he began to undress himself doggedly. As for the woman, she crept around the corner of the curtain and began without a sound to prepare for the bed. Wang Lung said gruffly, When you lie down, put the light out first. Then he lay down and drew the thick quilt about his shoulders and pretended to sleep. But he was not sleeping. He lay quivering, every nerve of his flesh awake. And when, after a long time, the room went dark, and there was the slow, silent, creeping movement of the woman beside him, an exultation filled him fit to break his body. He gave a hoarse laugh into the darkness and seized her.